those were two great discussions about introducing you to Amazentis and Urolithin A, and then also discussing its use in older populations. Um, but for me, my relationship, which I do have to disclose, I am an employee of Amazentis. My relationship with them began um, because I am a sports dietitian working with an elite basketball team in the NBA. And one of the things that we very much care about in athletics is mitochondrial health. And I'll give you a second to get the slides up. But um, this relationship, um, that my, my discovery of urolithin A began because of some of the work that Louise is actually doing that she'll discuss. Um, but it, there we go. Um, oh, actually, before I get started, um, so this was originally supposed to be a presentation given by Dr. Jamie Whitfield, but he is not able to be with here, here with us today, so that's why I've been able to step in, and Louise also can be here. Um, but we're going to talk about mitochondria and sport performance, and specifically the Enduro study. So, as I was saying, um, you all know that mitochondria, and as we, excuse me, as we have heard, mitochondria are important for a number of reasons, and especially when it comes to exercise. Um, this was, these are some images taken from a recent review on the effects of exercise on uh, mitochondrial quality. And as you can see, exercise is a stress response, or excuse me, induces a stress response that the mitochondria will then go through specific dynamics and uh, balancing uh, procedures to hopefully increase their mitochondrial function. Uh, what, with this in mind, a lot of studies and research has gone into looking at how can we continue to improve mitochondrial function. Um, and among these kind of uh, areas that have been looked into, one of them has been polyphenols, which again, you know, are mit micronutrients in plants and plant products. And this was a paper by Somerville and colleagues that actually looked at uh, a lot of different polyphenol products and their um, effect on performance through a number of different tests. And you can see here that the average, or in this forest plot, the, uh, the accumulated effect was about a one point, I believe it was 1.9% uh, increase. But one of the issues with polyphenols is the bioavailability. And you saw these slides um, during Stu's presentation, and this is where urolithin A comes in. We know that, see, this was a clinical trial done. I'm not gonna go over all of this because you guys have already seen it, but you can see here that urolithin A is a bioavailable um, product. And you saw these two. Um, these are the most recent results from our publication in Cell Press um, showing the benefits of urolithin A supplementation on muscle strength. So to kind of bring it back full circle, this isn't a product that's just great for um, older populations, cellular health and mitochondria is actually affecting everyone from recreational to elite athletes as well as those working with um, these types of folks. Sorry. Okay, so. <laughs> To bring it all back, limitation of polyphenols is their bioavailability, and urolithin A seems to circumvent this. Um, but we know that this is present in older populations, but our next question is, how does this translate into athletes? So I'm actually gonna hand it over to Louise to get into the Enduro study. Thank you, Emily, and I apologise on behalf of Jamie that he can't present this himself. Um, Jamie is the postdoc in our group of the Exercise and Nutrition Research Program at Mary MacKillop, and over the two years of COVID, he lives in Melbourne and he spent 500 days in lockdown, and then he came to the US and got COVID. <laughs> um, so this, the first time I saw these slides was about three minutes ago. <laughs> um, so I'm going to do the best to speak to them. So we were approached by Amazentis to um, see our interest in undertaking this study. And I have to say at first, I'm not really usually interested in doing um, industry studies because I have worries about the perception of the bias and whether the companies are really interested in the science. But it wasn't until we sat down and, and spoke with the company and saw both the commitment to science and the underlying story that we became interested. 
So we talked about a model in which we would try and induce um, mitochondrial biogenesis in a group of athletes and wonder whether we could amplify the outcome by increasing the rate of mitophagy so that the rate of the improvement in the better mitochondria would then translate into better um, muscle function and performance. We came up with um, the Enduro study, so um, I can't do a study unless it's got a cool name. And so we were doing endurance athletes who took urolithinone, see what I did, and came up with um, our project. So basically we've um, recruited middle distance runners. We were interested in a group that um, would normally do um, altitude training as one of the key periodised parts of their program. And we also wanted a group that could um, compete in an event that was short enough that they'd be able to do at 110% um, um, of performance before and after altitude. And we decided that we would um, break it into two groups, a group we would call the elite group that we were going to concentrate on the performance outcomes, and then in a group that um, we called them sub-elite, who would be prepared to give up a, a muscle biopsy so that we could see what was happening at that um, cellular level. Um, as it turned out, some of our better runners were happy to have a biopsy. So when I present the data, we've called them still the sub-elite and the elite group because that's how it was described in the ethics application. But as, as it turns out, there's quite a bit of an overlap in the um, calibre and the physiological characteristics of the two groups. But we basically, the design of the study was to have our um, elite group come in do some preliminary um, testing of their physiological characteristics, including VO2 max, substrate utilisation, running economy. And then they would do two races. The first race um, and the second race were, were both these 3,000 metre track races and they were runners real life events, you know, all running at the same time with an audience and etc. And we had them do two um, races 72 hours apart, which we thought might mimic a race program at one of the major meets, because one of the things we're looking at to see is, is there an effect of the urolithin A on acute muscle damage? And then they would go up to altitude. In the altitude camp, each of the groups does one day a week a downhill running session. That's quite a um, usual protocol in the coaching groups that we work with. Um, downhill running is prized because it's been shown to improve economy, but also it's in, in, in causing damage. So we wondered again whether we could amplify some of the benefits of um, doing this kind of training by having the urolithin A exacerbating the, the mitophagy. And so at the end of the three weeks of the altitude camp, um, then they come back and they do a third race. So we've seen the effect of performance um, before and after the altitude, as well as the acute effect on um, um, muscle damage. With our sub-elite runners, we have them do the same program, but in this case, they're doing muscle biopsies at the beginning and at the end, rather than doing the racing. We, we don't feel that we can have people perform optimally with a head of a biopsy, so we've tried to, to do them into the two groups. So the um, measures that we're going to be undertaking are looking at the um, pharmacokinetics of the um, urolithin A. We're looking at muscle damage, inflammation, both in response to the um, races and the downhill running. We'll have a look at some metabolomics in um, the muscle and the, um, the blood samples that we've got. We've got a performance outcome, and in the muscle biopsies, we'll also be looking at um, mitochondrial respiration. Now, at the moment, we can't show you the finished data because um, COVID's in, incurred in this um, period of time. We plan to do all our data collection on two camps. We wanted to um, divide our subjects into sort of groups of about 20 so that we could handle that number. Um, and we've had so many COVID interruptions as everyone in the world has faced, um, including different states in Australia shutting down and not letting their subjects move from one state to the other, and then some of our facilities having to um, halve the number of rooms that they could have available to allow athletes to be socially distanced. So we're about to do a third camp um, at the end of the year, and we hope we'll have the full data set. But this is um, the, the pool data set from um, the groups. I have to say, this is you know, probably my, one of my first times doing um, industry-funded research, and I cannot believe the degree of rigour that's imposed on us. I thought we were already careful as researchers, but um, there's absolutely no way I can work out who's on what from um, the, the way the 
the product's been provided to us and the, the blinding. So we can see some big changes over the course of the, um, the study in the pooled groups, but we don't know what's happening with um, the effect of the training and altitude and what's happening with the, um, the urolithin A. But what we have seen so far is a... Um, a change in the damage that occurs with the, the downhill running. So the two graphs here, we've got the effect of um, the races and the effect of the downhill running um, in this three races and three downhill um, running sessions over the three weeks of the altitude camp. Um, and we do see that there's a reduction in the CK production on the second and the third weeks of um, the altitude camp, we don't see much change um, with the changes with the, the race between um, races one, two and three. This is looking at um, 24 to 36 hours post each of those sessions. In the lab, we've um, looked at a number of things. We're um, looking here at the um, VO2 max changes. And if we have a um, look on the left-hand side, we can see that there's a, an improvement um, in VO2 in both the elite and the sub-elite groups. And what we've got on the right-hand side is the economy stages. So there's four stages that they run at. And you can see that there's actually, if you can under, see underneath what's happening with those, all the individual cases, there is an increase in oxygen use over the um, course of the four, four weeks between the, the two sessions. Um, and that's because, as we'll see in a minute, there's a change in substrate utilisation at those same speeds. But in terms of the oxygen utilisation for the same percentage of VO2 max, which has gone up, um, there's actually a reduction. Um, so in terms of what do they gain so far in terms of their VO2 max increases over the, the, um, the study, we're getting really robust changes. We've also looked at haemoglobin mass changes, and we're seeing probably the higher range of what occurs in elite athletes who go and do altitude training, which is one of the reasons why we get um, good uptake when we put out recruitment notices because people know when they come on our camps they always improve, we feed them well, look after them well and um, probably take away some of the, the laziness that goes with athletic lifestyle that um, sometimes doesn't optimise outcomes. Um, there's just looking at the substrate utilisation in our economy stages in the pre and post situation and you can see that there's an increase in fat utilisation and a reduction in carbohydrate utilisation for the same speeds showing that increase in fitness so they're now working at a relatively lower intensity for the same speed. Um, and so far we haven't seen any changes in the mitochondrial oxidation or the respiration. So we've still got low numbers of this because we've um, only taken this from the subjects who've taken the muscle biopsies. We're not sure whether we'll see anything when we get the bigger group and whether when we tease out who's on the urolithin A or not, we'll see a difference. Um, but that's how the study's progressing so far. And then the final thing, athletes really just care about performance. And this is the um, change from race one to two to three in the bigger group. And we've seen a 2% improvement in their 3,000 metre time trial performance so far. But again, we can't discern who's on what. And we certainly have asked each of them to um, nominate whether they think they're on it and whether they know who else in the group's on it. And so it'll be interesting to reveal those um, outcomes when we get to the end. So I'd just like to um, thank all the um, collaborators in my group that do all the busy work with this. I think Alana's in the room and she's one of the, the key workers here. But um, if Jamie was here, he would have done a much better job with talking to you about it. And I'm really sad for him that he's not. But thank you very much for the opportunity.